So your TA Serenity is lazy. She hates two-dimensional conduction problems because they are way too complicated, especially with a composite wall like this problem here. So she takes two-dimensional problems and models them as one-dimensional conduction problems through a wall. The problem, though, is that there's actually two different ways to one-dimensionalize the heat flow, and you'll get a different answer each way. Because one method is gonna give you a lower bound underestimate of the amount of heat flow, and then the other approximation is gonna give you an upper bound overestimate of the actual heat flow. So first, a super quick mini lecture to help you understand the difference between these two assumptions, and then we'll come back and actually solve this problem numerically and get to a, a, a real numbers final answer. So first consider this simple composite wall that just has four sections, hot on the left, cold on the right, and then you've got wood and steel. Heat flows very easily through metal, but wood is kind of an insulator. So you can see now with these red arrows what the energy wants to do. Some small amount of energy will kind of go along the top through the wood and steel, and another small amount of energy will go through the bottom, through the steel and then the wood. But a lot more of the energy, what it wants to do, is pass through the steel both times. But all of that energy can't just instantaneously jump right through that point right at the corner. So actually the energy kind of gets pushed and has to sort of cut the corner and partially go through a little bit of the wood in order to get to the other area of steel. So your TA Indy is here just in time for the main conclusion that two-dimensional real-world conduction is a little bit messy. The heat doesn't only flow through just the steel and then just the wood. The real energy is gonna start off through the steel and then kind of cut across the corner of the wood to get to the other part of steel. But fortunately, there's gonna be two pretty good ways that we can approximate this as one-dimensional flow. And for the first assumption, we will say that all vertical surfaces are at a constant temperature. And what this allows is this allows any of the heat to sort of instantaneously warp vertically. So if we envision slicing our wall in half vertically and separating two vertical sections, we're essentially allowing all of the energy to choose which section it wants to go through first, and most of it will go through the steel, just a little bit through the wood. And then it essentially resets, and all of that energy gets to make a new decision through the new section of wall. And through the second part of the wall, most of the energy goes through the top steel section. So we're just slicing the wall in half vertically and saying each of these vertical sections are all the same temperature, treating each vertical section of the wall as a separate piece. The other way to one-dimensionalize composite walls is to slice it in half horizontally. We would describe this as by saying that horizontal surfaces are adiabatic. We're saying that our red arrows, the path that energy takes as it cuts through the wall, is always strictly horizontal. There's no vertical jumping at all, right? So this is like taking each horizontal section and separating them and saying once energy starts down one path, it just keeps going horizontally through that path. And note what this means, though, is at these vertical intersections, like where the steel and the wood meet, the top half and the bottom half might not be at the same temperature. You might actually have different temperatures at these interfaces, even though they're vertically connected, right? So it's just a different assumption. It's not more or less valid than the other assumption. It's just different. But if you're trying to choose which one should you use for a given problem, the real answer is maybe you should actually do both. By slicing your wall in half vertically and assuming that vertical sections are at the same temperature, you're giving your system the best possible case scenario. You're finding an upper bound for the maximum possible heat transfer because you're allowing all of the energy to instantaneously warp wherever it wants to go to take the path of least resistance. Whereas slicing your wall in half horizontally is a worst case scenario you're not allowing any of the energy to try to take a different path to get to like an area of easier conduction. You're forcing it to take paths that it might not otherwise want to go through. So that will give you a lower bound. It's the minimum possible heat transfer your system would have. And so by calculating both answers using both set of assumptions, you give yourself a range. You know that your actual heat transfer has to be in between this minimum and maximum value. All right, well, your TA Indiana left us, but your TA Serenity's taking a nap, so she'll probably be here for the long haul.
All right, so first we are going to make the vertical split assumption. We're gonna separate this wall vertically and assume that all vertical surfaces have the same temperature. So I'm gonna be solving this problem using thermal resistances, right? An electrical circuit with resistors in series and parallel representing all of the series and parallel paths that heat can use to get through this system. So I start off by numbering each block one through seven. So as I write out my electrical circuit, first, all of the heat has to go through resistor one. That's the initial red vertical wall. There's no other path. It has to go through that one. So you got one resistor by itself. Then the energy has a choice. It can go through the top green section, the middle orange section, or the bottom green section. So that's three resistors in parallel. It can choose to go through either of those three. And in fact, two and four are actually identical. So if you wanted to, you could actually combine the two green into one single space but I'm gonna leave them separate so that my electrical circuit more easily matches my picture, which makes it easier to double check afterwards that I'm not making a mistake. So I'm labeling the interface there after that term as TH, and then the next section, the next vertical section of wall has a blue and yellow section, so there's two more resistors in parallel. And then TI is the temperature at the next interface. And then finally, there's the red section of wall, just one section, all of the energy, doesn't matter if you went through the blue or the yellow, all of it has to go through that last red section. So just one resistor for the last section of wall. Four series sections, meaning there's like four vertical sections of wall that all the energy has to pass through. And then within each vertical section, if there's more than one path through that vertical section, those are all resistors in parallel. So to solve a heat transfer problem in the style of an electrical circuit, you've got Q dot is equal to delta T divided by the resistance. This is sort of like V equals I times R, where your voltage is your change in temperature, your current is the thing that flows, that's your heat, and then your resistance is everything else. In the case of walls, it's gonna be L over Ka. But we rearrange V equals I times R as I equals V divided by R, Again, I is Q, that's your heat. So you've got Q equals delta T divided by your resistances. So for my resistances, again, there's four sections in series. So I've got four terms added up. The first and the last resistor by themselves, so R1 and R7 are easy. The two middle terms though are a little bit more complicated because solving resistors in parallel is a little bit of extra work. So to combine resistors in parallel, it's one divided by and then in the big denominator, it's a bunch of one over R for each of the resistors that are in parallel. So before plugging in numbers, solving for the final answer, let's go ahead and draw the other electrical circuit for the other assumption that we could make, the horizontal split assumption. For this drawing, we're assuming that horizontal surfaces are adiabatic. So every horizontal surface in the middle of my wall, I extend that horizontal surface all the way across the entire drawing to make a complete slice. So that's between the green and the orange, the other interface between the orange and the green, and then between the blue and the yellow. So based on these three slices, I cut my composite wall into four distinct pathways. So all heat transfer is strictly horizontal. All of my heat transfer arrows are only horizontal. There's no chance for them to move vertically. So when I divide horizontally at every horizontal surface, I end up with four different pathways that the energy can take. And as I start to draw my circuit, each of these four pathways will be in parallel. So even the red wall, even though it's just one big red wall, I've sliced that red wall on the far left side into four different pieces. So that initial red section of the wall will actually be four different resistors representing the portion of the red wall that's in the four different paths. Finishing the circuit diagram, each of the four paths will pass through four sections of wall. So like the top path will go through red, green, blue, red. The bottom section through red, green, yellow, red. And I'm not gonna label them all, but the second from the top would go through red and then orange, then blue, then red, right, etc. Now, unfortunately, once we numerically solve for the actual resistances of each of these sections of wall, we're not gonna be able to use the same resistances on both of our electrical circuits. So even though, say, the red section of the wall is the same material on both of my electrical circuits, on my left-hand drawing, where I've sliced horizontally, I've changed the amount of surface area. I've split this one big solid red wall into four smaller pieces. And since surface area is part of electrical resistance, I'm actually gonna have to calculate separate resistances for both of these drawings 
that's gonna be a lot of resistors. That's a lot of L over KA. Good news is it's not hard work, but bad news it is tedious busy work. So since there's fewer resistors on the, the vertical temperature assumption, let's go ahead and do that one first. Let's just solve for the seven resistors first and get all the way to a numerical answer for that one. So resistance for one dimensional conduction through a plane wall is just gonna be L over KA, the length of that section of wall divided by the conduction coefficient times the surface area. And now in the problem statement, the actual surface area of this wall is five meters by eight meters. And what we're shown here is just like a cross section that repeats many times throughout the wall. So for my area, I'm just gonna use the actual vertical height that we have, the 12 centimeters, 0.12 meters. And let's just assume a depth into the screen of one meter for simplicity. Oh, and of course, when it comes time to plug in numbers, your TA Serenity actually does abandon us also. So I guess she's not here for the long haul. So R1, this is the skinny red section on the left-hand side, only has a depth of 0 0.01 meters. We are given a value of K of two watts per meter Kelvin. And I'm using a surface area of 0.12 meters squared. Again, that's the full height of 12 centimeters and a depth of one meter. And at the very end of the problem, I'm gonna have to multiply to scale up this area to the full area, but I'm just using the small cross section for now. I'll go ahead and do the other red resistor R7 over on the right-hand side. This has a longer depth, 0 0.06 meters. The same value for K, just two, and the same value for area, 0 0.12 meters squared. And get 0.25 Kelvin per watts for the resistance. I'll look at the blue R5 next, a distance of 10 centimeters. We are given K of 15, and it's only half of the height, only six centimeters, so its area is gonna be 0 0.06 meters squared. Six centimeters high, one meter deep. The yellow resistance, same 10 centimeter length, same surface area of 0.06, but a larger conduction coefficient, 35 was given. So the two green resistances are the same. We've got a length of five centimeters in the numerator. The denominator has a K value of 20, and then the height of four centimeters gives us 0 0.04 meters squared for the area. Last resistor in orange, same five centimeter length as the green one, same 0 0.04 meters squared area as the green, but a different value for K, only eight. So we plug R1 through R7 into our big giant equation with all of these parallel terms in the one over denominator. I'll do one stage of calculator work to get me down to just these four resistances in series. Combine one more time to get 0.351 as my total combined resistance for the entire wall cross section. And this gives me a value of Q dot of 569.8 watts. But this was only the heat transfer through this section of the wall. Remember the whole wall is actually 40 meters squared, not just 0.12 meters squared, right? So if the full area is 40 meters squared and my cross section is only 0.12 meters squared, so that means I need to multiply the cross-sectional value of Q by 333 to get the total heat transfer through the entire wall. And that gives me Q dot of 189.9 kilowatts. And this will represent an upper bound, the maximum possible heat transfer through the wall since we've given the most generous assumption possible, allowing heat to instantaneously jump vertically so it can go through whatever easiest section, most, con most heat conducting section it wants. So now for the horizontally sliced sections, we're assuming that horizontal surfaces are adiabatic. And with this new clean drawing, once heat chooses a path, A, B, C, or D, it just stays on that path all the way till it's through the wall, right? Worst case scenario. So to solve this, I'm gonna look at each of these four paths separately and solve for a resistance for each path, A, B, C, and D, by just adding the resistors horizontally through the wall. Then once I've solved for our A, B, C, and D through each horizontal section, I'll combine each of these four in parallel since each of the four paths are four parallel options. So our A starts off going through the red section of wall, just a one centimeter length. The value of K was two. And now the surface area is not the entire vertical 12 centimeters. It's only the four centimeter height that is the height of this section A. And you can see as I write the resistance for the green, blue, and other red terms that the surface area for this entire horizontal path, all of the areas will be the same. All of the areas will be the same 0 0.04 meters squared. And the only thing that's changing is the horizontal length and then the value of K for each different section of the wall made of each different material. Where the green has a K of 20, blue has a K of 15, and then the red has a K of two. And then each section length is one centimeter, five, 10, and then six. 
calculator work, add these terms up. 1.105 is the electrical resistance through this top section of wall. So now let's look at our B, the resistance through the second section that goes through the orange and then the blue. Even though this method has more resistors, 16 instead of only seven in the other one, you can see once you kind of get into a groove that they all flow pretty easily, right? The numerators are gonna be exactly the same for path B as path A, right? There's still the one centimeter, five centimeter, 10 centimeter, six centimeter. It's still the same horizontal lengths for all four sections of the wall. In the denominator along path B, they're all two centimeters tall. It's just half of the orange section. So all four areas are 0.02. And then lastly, all we have to do is fill in the K values for each of the different wall sections, two, eight, 15, and two. Hmm, some calculator work can get to 2.4 as resistance for path B. Path C is gonna be the same sort of formula, just four fractions, right? Just four sections of wall in series. Same lengths as before, one, five, 10, and six. The area of this section is all gonna be 0 0.02, which is half of the height of the orange section. And then just fill in the values for K, 2, 8, 35, and 2. Calculator work and get to 2.21 Kelvin per watt for the resistance for section C. And last part D, four sections of wall, same four lengths, one centimeter, five, 10, and six. This section of the wall is taller. It's the full height of the green section. So all of the areas are the same, 0 0.04. And we just plug in the K values, 2, 20, 35, and 2. Calculator work, get to an R value 1.01 .01 for this bottom path. So a lot more calculator work for this section, but not a lot of extra brain power. Actually, this part was just really boring, long, and tedious, not actually mentally challenging, which makes it actually kind of nice sometimes, sort of a relief. So now to combine them, right? When energy is passing through the wall, it can choose any of these four different paths. So these four different paths are all in parallel. Within the wall, heat goes in series through each color, but when choosing which horizontal path, those are all in parallel. So now this section of the math is one divided by one over uh, all these fractions. I get a combined resistance of 0.36, which is actually kind of a good sign that we haven't made a mistake because this is pretty close actually to the combined resistance we got from the other problem, right? The previous combined resistance was 0.35. So even though we made two totally different assumptions and solved this problem with two totally different circuits, we're actually getting answers that are pretty close together, which means that our range is gonna be pretty narrow and that's, that's a good thing. So we use our, our V equals I times R or I equals V divided by R equivalent electrical circuit versus heat transfer as Q dot equals delta T divided by the total resistance and get 552.8 Watts. And again, this was the energy passing through just this one section of the wall. There's, the real wall is 333 times bigger. So once we scale up to the total surface area, we get 184 kilowatts. And now we zoom out and compare our two different solutions to give us a range. We know that the actual heat transfer rate will be greater than the 184 kilowatts that we got by assuming adiabatic horizontal surfaces. And we know that the heat transfer rate will be smaller than the 189.9 kilowatts that we got with the best case scenario, assuming that vertical surfaces were the same temperature. So depending on your problem statement, you might not have to actually go through both of these solution methods. You might only need to choose one. So just read really carefully exactly what the problem is asking for, or maybe check with your professor or textbook to see which method they prefer that you use. But for the most accurate answer, solve it both ways to give yourself a range that you know that your actual heat transfer Q dot will be in between. If you want more practice doing thermal resistances, but you want to see a problem with cylinders instead of just plain walls, go ahead and click on the video linked on the screen now.